Wow, Quazera, that was amazing. <laughs> I was sitting there thinking, who would have ever imagined that you and Arnold Schwarzenegger, Schwarzenegger had the same problem? <laughs> Neither of you can get by the Constitution to get into the White House, but we're honored by your comments today and your hard work and dedication and honored by the team of people who surround you. Um, let's, let's join together in thanking him again, please. This is an exciting day, and it's something that our team has just been working months for. We ask ourselves, how do we better support you and better support our time together so that it becomes meaningful and that collectively you enjoy and benefit from things that wouldn't be possible if we didn't come together like this today. So I'm really, really happy about this uh, event, happy that our team could be here, and I want to ask you to please join with me in thanking all of them who've been working for so many months uh, to bring Summer Institute together. I want to make special mention of Pauline Yance and Rebecca Stanley, who've been the co-leads for this year's Summer Institute, and someone who never really gets recognized, who takes care of logistics to make our meals and our facility so comfortable, Lindsay Dyson. Those ladies are really dedicated. Oh! <laughs> So we're in our work growing and building off of so many relationships, just as you are in your communities. And I want to mention some of those key partners. I see Rebecca Payne up here in the front representing the North Carolina Department of Public Instruction. Rebecca, thank you for being with us. The Department of Public Instruction and the State Board of Education have been instrumental to this work, as have our community college partners and university partners. It's truly remarkable in this state. Uh, unlike other states, to have those relationships to build upon, so we are delighted uh, to have those partners with us. Also want to rec recognize uh, the National Academy Foundation. Where are our National Academy partners today? Can you guys jump up and wave? All right, maybe not. Bill Taylor's here with the National Academy. There's one right there. There's another. Hello, folks. In a few weeks, we'll be announcing an important new partnership with the National Academy Foundation, and we are honored by their presence and delighted to be able to collaborate uh, with them uh, going forward. You know, you heard it uh, from Quasay's comments, and you heard it from Joyce and Pauline. This is about learning together and learning and growing together. And over the past 10 years, that's exactly what's been happening. You are a community of learners who shared with one another, built with one another, helped us learn and grow in our work, and we're very, very honored by that. In just a few short years, what you have quickly done for the state is you now lead in graduation rates uh, for North Carolina. You now lead by example in building ties with business and industry in colleges and universities. You now lead in creating the environment where all students, but especially students like the student we just heard from, have the individual support uh, and a high set of expectations for them to do things that maybe couldn't be done otherwise. That is an extraordinary record that you have built through your hard work. Uh, and I have enjoyed coming in to Summer Institute hearing so many new stories about the sacrifices that you've made for individual students and in some cases for individual families. I personally call that leading learning. Personally, I call that leading learning. In fact, I want to ask you to sort of help me out here a little bit. I know it's after lunch, the room's dark, you're gonna fall asleep. You're not gonna fall asleep. Help me out. I lead learning. Y'all could outdo them. Can you outdo them? Let's all do it. You do lead learning and you can feel it. I can feel it, just like you felt it when we heard from our student just a few moments ago. It's a deeply personal thing to make a commitment to do something that hasn't been done before and to demonstrate what can be done with students who sometimes have been left behind. Sometimes have been left behind. In every chair, in every seat in this room is somebody who leads learning and that's why I wanted to go through that corny exercise of asking you to make that statement. So thank you for that. There's a story that occurs to me as I was thinking about this 10th anniversary. Early in my career working at the university, I was a part of a team that realized that there were lots of students who weren't allowed access to the university. So we joined together to open an intermediate care dormitory on the campus. And this particular dormitory was established so that children 
who had had significant uh, impairments to their spinal cord, who were lo losing mobility, typically losing the use of their arms, certainly their legs, so that these students who, could, who had that particular barrier in their lives could gain access to a college education. And this particular dorm was a very, very uh, supportive uh, care facility so that the students had the individual attendant care so that every morning they could get out and get dressed and get into those classes. And we spent a lot of time listening to the students about what their needs were to be certain. They were prepared to navigate the complexity of college life and prepared to take on that extra challenge of navigating a campus that way too often presented barriers for their access to physically get into a classroom. And it was a fascinating experience. These were wonderful students. And by typically no fault of their own, really, they had this mobility impairment that left them with limited, uh, limited use of their arms and their bodies. Bright, excited young people, like most young people are, who were delighted with the opportunity uh, to have access uh, to a college education. And we felt like we had taken care of everything. We really had thought it through. A few days after the dorm had opened and our students were there, we got called in by the fire department and everybody was fine, but you can imagine our alarm in running into a building where there are people who have mobility issues and there's smoke in the premises. It turns out that we really hadn't thought it through. We didn't know that, for example, our students would figure out how to call for a pizza and how to take a pizza and put it in the oven to warm it up and didn't really think that the pizza should come out of the box before it goes in the oven. So it was a kind of humbling experience to get that realization we'd underestimated our students. And their professors had underestimated our students. Um, many of the professors thought the students really shouldn't be on their campus because they needed help with taking notes and sometimes they had to record lessons and sometimes an attendant had to be with them to help navigate that classroom. For our students in that dorm, the visible limitation of their wheelchair and their assistance devices, that visible limitation prevented a barrier for many of the faculty who would discount our students. Even though those students came in with every bit as much a gift as we heard from Quisera in his comments earlier today. And what those students taught us was that quite often the barrier is not the obvious things like a wheelchair, but what is in the hearts and minds of adults who have to recalibrate their thinking to be certain that no barrier, real or imagined, stands in the way of the opportunity of children to access a meaningful future. And those students taught me a lesson that has stuck with me for the rest of my career. And I think the students that you are living with are teaching you those same lessons over and over again. That too often it is what's in our hearts, in our minds, not the barriers that the students themselves possess. You are leading student-centered schools. And student-centered schools provide day-to-day -day learning so that you can lead toward a different outcome, and you are leading toward a different outcome. It really reminds me of the North Carolina motto. I love our state's motto. I'm very proud of our state's motto, esse quam verdere, to be rather than to seem, to be rather than to seem, and that's what you collectively are doing in your work. Um, it should come as no surprise to anyone here that we're living in a deeply partisan time, and one of the things that I think about quite a bit is that while people are being partisan and there are lots of uh, arguments going on not too far from here, over the last 10 years, the one thing that has not been up for debate is the support for you and the work that you are creating. And think about that. During one of the worst budget cycles in uh, uh, living memory, they've continued to expand the work that you do. And it's because of your leadership, not because of North Carolina New Schools. <clears throat> It's because of your leadership, not because of North Carolina New Schools. And I want to reinforce that as we think about what's to come. Right now, today, uh, the members of the General Assembly and others around them are, are talking about something called the North Carolina Workforce and Education Innovation Act. And I hope you'll follow that act through the budget negotiation because it is intended to expand the support for additional communities like yours uh, to expand the work across regions and across districts. And we see that again as being a direct result of the advocacy that many of you have brought 
to your communities and to our government at every level. So that's a real testament uh, to the work that you have done, and we are grateful for that. So they gave me a clicker. I don't know where to point it. Ah, there you go. Um, so I, I think my charge was to talk about sort of the evolution of the work, and uh, uh, I just want to make a couple of quick comments about that. You know, we began with a simple idea. That is, if we uh, created some partners and learned together what it takes to grow a different approach to education, could we then look at that work and rethink supports for teachers and administrators and designs and relationships with business and industry and colleges and universities and build from that a statewide movement? as you heard earlier. And I'd say if you look around this room, we're well along the way of creating a statewide movement to be certain that one day every child enjoys the kind of experience that your students enjoy and that we heard from Quasi earlier uh, in his comments. And again, we couldn't do that without the partnership of our colleges and universities, and they are extraordinary. I was this morning in the session with the UNCG iSchool and the Second Life program from East Carolina University. Extraordinary work that they're doing. We're delighted to partner with them, um, but it's a perfect illustration of how we can work together to extend access in ways we've never been able to have before. And I'm very, very excited about uh, those partnerships. So we began this work, what I call a sort of a 1.0 model. And the 1.0 model is looking at the teaching strategies and the student support strategies and the design components that were correlated with success, not just here in North Carolina, but across the country. So at that time, we spent a, a great deal of effort taking members of the State Board of Education and our partners at the Department of Public Instruction and other institutions across the country to look at schools that had made a commitment to all and whose evidence really showed that they went beyond those words to actually deliver on that promise of all meaning all. So very developmental work in that first stage. And then we realized that North Carolina is a rural state largely, and we have lots of communities that are remote that may lack the resources that a place like the Research Triangle can offer. And so we began to look at designs that focused on virtual strategies and a set of communities that could test out what would it look like if we tried to bring those same supports and same partnerships to schools in more remote communities to connect them into colleges and universities and see what that evidence might look like. What would that teach us about how to extend these supports into every single community? And lots of lessons learned from there. And then we began talking about regional schools and STEM education and recognizing that economic development and education can't really ever be separated we all have high aspirations for the value of education to create learners and solvers and creators, but that link to economic and workforce development is very, very critical. And so the regional strategies and schools and the emphasis on STEM skills development and the learnings in those relationships became the next part of our focus. And we're still learning and growing in that work. And then lastly, evolving strategies to extend what you've learned across districts or across feeder patterns of schools in larger districts. And on Thursday, we'll be talking a bit about going forward, what will those supports look like for districts? Initially, we'll partner with a small group of districts who really have a deep commitment to this work. And many of the districts in this room, in fact, have recognized that because of the schools you've created, there's something special there. There's really something special that needs to be offered to every student and can't be offered to every student until we go deep, really deep, in rethinking change to teaching, change to leading, and change structures. And also going forward, what we think of as a 5.0, that we recognize that our universities and the schools and colleges of education are critical to this equation. We're going to be asking the schools and colleges of education to partner in discussions about how do we approach pre-service preparation in new and different ways. There is a lot to be learned in this room. There's a lot you have learned and solved that they need to be attending to very, very carefully. And so that conversation is going to pick up here very, very soon. And so what is not in that 1.0, 2.0, 3.0 model is the notion of a network and the value of a network and the value of these relationships that you're growing in this work together. I want to make one last point about the evolution of our work focused around that notion of networking and peer support. Too often, in fact, commonly across the country, you see bright lights, schools that do amazing things, they have charismatic leaders, and the promise of that school lasts for about the tenure 
of that leader. And too often, the lessons of that school are not extended across other schools and certainly not extended across districts. We see networking, intentional networking, as one way of being certain that those bright lights turn into forest fires, that they're not just limited to one classroom or one group of classrooms. Secondly, that too often it's possible for hardworking teams of teachers and their administrators to do exciting things to not be recognized by their districts. In fact, districts are so busy and under different pressures, they might not even really deeply understand what kind of teaching and learning is leading to those outcomes. So helping districts through networking activities focus on changed teaching and changed leading. And finally, the odds of an individual school affecting state policy and motivating change that grows from an individual school to a movement, the odds of that really happening are really quite skinny. But we think, in fact we know, uh, by working together, by collaborating together, we're helping to move an agenda that is much broader than this room, that is affecting every community in North Carolina and over time will affect policies that are essential to what we need to be creative in classrooms, such as rethinking assessments. We all know that assessments are currently flawed and many of you are working on piloting new approaches to assessments and advocating new approaches to assessments that have to be available to everyone. So the networking behaviors that are here are critically important. And I wanna end uh, with one sort of last story. Um, it seems like a morning for stories. Uh, many of you, and certainly North Carolina New Schools, are regularly visited by people from around the country. I've lost count, I mean around the world, I've lost count uh, how many visitors we've had from places like Argentina and Israel and Singapore and, and London and Australia, the list goes on and on. Many of you are visited because this work is beginning to take not just a national reputation but an international reputation. And several months ago, I had one particular visitor that stood out for me. This is someone who just really profoundly affected me and my understanding about children. Uh, his name is uh, Gonzalo Emilios, and you see him up here on the screen. He was so excited to be here in America. He was from the capital city of Uruguay. And he had come to Raleigh to talk with us because, uh, his friends call him Gonzo, by the way, because Gonzo um, is the principal of a school in the capital city of Uruguay that essentially serves young people who dumpster dive to survive. All of his kids uh, live in very marginal lives. They have difficulty accessing food uh, and basic necessities in their lives. And so what Gonzo does is he goes out and he fundraises and he created the school to give them a safe place and, and trying to create a school that's relevant to their needs and relevant to their lives. And he came to me wanting to know, he said, I get this whole idea of support, material support, but I really need help with thinking about teaching. And how do I change teaching to make it relevant to my students? Because their lives are so challenged that it has to be something different. It has to be centered, centered on the world that they know and the life that they live. So uh, Gonzo and I visited with some of you and we had this uh, deep conversation uh, about uh, his experience there. And what was really interesting about Gonzo, uh, first of all, I, I left out one detail that it, he's actually Father Gonzo um, and he's a parish priest in um, the capital city in Uruguay. And he um, didn't really tell me too much about his services in the country, but he did say after we talked about teaching and learning and that's the essential work of growing great schools that he was intending to go back to his country's uh, minister of education and the president of Uruguay and talk about this example. And January of this year rolled around, I hadn't heard from Gonzo or Father Gonzo, and then um, um, he sent me a picture of his friend and mentor uh, who is actually Pope Francis. <laughs> and then I learned last week that Father Gonzo has actually been named by Pope Francis to a special emissary role in the Vatican around education and the needs of high needs students. And I, I was thinking about you and our time together and thinking about isn't it a beautiful thing that the example that you set and the work that you're doing in this network and your support for one another can literally change the world, can literally change the world. And that's really what's begun to happen. You can be certain that Father Gonzo is taking that to the Vatican and that will become a big part of the work they'll be doing to advance education among poor populations around the world. It's an honor to be with you. It's an honor to learn and serve with you. I look forward to our time together here at Summer Institute and uh, uh, thank you for your hard work and service. Have a good afternoon.